the reptilian brain looks at something in the environment. Let's say this is the reptilian brain and it goes, do I eat it? Do I mate with it? Or do I kill it? Eat, mate, or kill like a bad college drinking game. On top of that is the mammalian brain that says before you eat, mate, or kill that thing, what impact does that have on the people that you love or your tribe? And then the cortex on top of that says, before you eat, mate, or kill that thing, what impact does that have on your long-term goals, like weight loss and health and fitness? I'm Dr. Michael Haley. This is the Dr. Haley Show podcast. And today's guest is Dr. Glenn Livingston. He helps people to stop overeating and find a more peaceful long-term relationship with food. He's the author of several books, including Never Binge Again and Defeat Your Cravings. Dr. Livingston's work, theories, and research have been published in major periodicals such as the New York Times, Los Angeles Times, Chicago Sun Times. <laughs> Dr. Livingston, thank you for joining me on the show and you being here in my hometown. You should have just come right over. I and... should have walked right on over. You could have <laughs> sat, sat around in a little little living room having coffee or something or, or herbal tea, as we were saying. Herbal tea, right. Sure. Yeah. It's funny. I feel funny saying this too, because we're going to be talking about food and food addictions. And it just so happens, I kind of know where you are right down the street from one of my favorite restaurants. There's the beach house down there. Can we have favorite restaurants and still talk about food addictions? And Oh, sure. <laughs> oh, sure. No, I, I mean, the way Defeat Your Craving is my latest book, and it's actually the most scientifically up to date and the one that people should read first if they would. But in that book, I talk about the way that cravings work. And cravings are very contextually bound, just in the same way that we know we need to stop at a red light and go at a green light. It's possible to construct for most people a set of conditions or rules to bind a particular treat to a particular context. So I only eat chocolate on Saturdays and no more than two ounces and only after I worked out. And what happens is the same thing that would happen at a casino if the slot machine only paid off on Saturday morning at 10 o'clock. At Saturday, on Saturday mornings, the casinos would be full. They'd see all those little ladies standing at the slot machines. But all week long, they'd stop doing that because they knew it wasn't going to pay off. And your brain will do the same thing. If you bind things to a particular context, most people, at least two out of three people, for most treats can work it out that they don't have to give them up. They, they can moderate them. There is that third person or sometimes fourth person that has dug such a deep neurological groove for a particular substance, and it does vary from substance to substance, mm -hmm. that they have to give it up entirely, maybe just for a while, for some people, sometimes forever. So, yeah, so it's entirely possible to have favorite restaurants. I think food is meant to be enjoyed. And the idea is to defeat your cravings, not be a slave to your cravings. So most people will tell you they enjoy food more and have a better sense of freedom once they've kind of mastered these techniques that are worse than if they're constricted. So yeah, you well, we, we can we can still meet at the beach house if you want to. Okay. Sounds good. Sounds good. Yeah. You know, I, and I think I'm going to tremendously benefit from this discussion because I definitely have my own challenges. And I know many people in, in the audience will as well. I do have a question and I'm going to display my own ignorance here. I read somewhere you're a former psychologist. And I honestly don't know what the credentials for psychologists are. Uh, I know you have PhD. Are there other initials? <laughs> Just call me Emperor, and we're all good. No, <laughs> no, I am. Um, I, what, what I offer today, by the way, is training, education, and coaching. I don't, I don't practice anymore under the, at least not with food issues. I offer training and education because I want to be a little freer to speak my mind on what I think is the. Um, Best standard of care. I have a PhD in clinical psychology from Yeshiva University in 1991. And then you have to get a certain number of hours of supervised practice and take a test and keep up with some continuing education and things like that. It's um, f five years after college, plus a certain amount of hours of supervised conduct and supervised practice. And then you can sit for the exam. So, okay. And then the fun starts. Then the fun really starts. I was told by some friends that I should let my license go so that I'm not bound by all the rules and regulations and I can speak freely. I don't know if you feel that way or not, but. 
Well, I, I don't even know if 100% that works because people could still say you're practicing even if you're not holding yourself out to be a doctor. But but yeah, so I, I have a PhD in clinical psychology. I used to be a child and family therapist. That's where most of my training was. But I had a serious problem with food myself, which led me on a 25 or 30 year adventure to figure out what the solution was. And I happened to write a book about it when I got divorced and it got really popular and I wound up with a little agency and a couple of thousand clients over eight or nine years and learned a lot about helping people struggle with food over the years along the way. I want to be straight with the audience and I want to, uh, I'm going to teach them something new because I've always led them to join different people's email lists and stuff. And I'm going to tell them what a lead magnet is in this case. A lead magnet is something that People like yourself, myself, will use to get you to join our email list. And it might be a free download or something that we would give to you for joining the email list. Now, the reason I'm telling them what that is, is because your lead magnet is awesome. <laughs> oh, thank you. That is, you have a lot of giveaways, including a full copy of your new book, which uh, I downloaded yesterday and started reading. Plus you had about 20 other downloads that I can't wait to get to. And your content is awesome. I've made it easy for my audience to find it. If you go to drhaley.com forward slash DYC for defeat your cravings, it will go right to your page where they can join your email list and people do it, get the downloads read an email or two. And if you like them, stay subscribed. If you don't, you can always unsubscribe. But wow, an excellent giveaway. And thank you for that. You can also always go to Defeat Your Cravings and click the big blue button. But yes, that's the book is available for free, for free in Kindle Nook and PDF format. Yeah, DefeatYourCravings.com, right? Yeah. Yes, yes, yes. Yeah. And that's how I got it. It was easy to find. So all right, now they know what a lead magnet is. <laughs> and there were some recordings on there too. I had listened to some things and learned some new things you were talking about. It'll make more sense at the end of the interview after we kind of explain how this all works. But yes, there's a food plan starter template and there's a binge recovery audio and a whole bunch of other things that would be helpful. I make an awful lot available for free because I know not everybody can afford our coaching or to pay us for other things. And my goal is to help a million people a year to stop overeating. So I'm Try to make an wow. awful lot available for free and a percentage of people go on to our paid materials. Yeah. Now, yeah, your content seems awesome too. When I'm reading your book, I see things that are logical, scientific, and presented in a way with a good dose of humor. Well, and you're thank very you. transparent as well. You're very transparent about yourself and some of the things that you've experienced in life. And I was completely able to relate to one area in particular because when I was a kid, well, I say a kid, when I was in college, I would work out with a friend of mine and we loved Sundays because on Sundays, there was a pizza special where you'd get two large pizzas and two, two liters of Coke for 10 bucks. And we were on a college budget. So what did we do? We went to the gym and when we got back, we ordered that and we each ate our own large pizza and drank our own two liter <laughs> bottle of Coke. Yeah. And you talked about being in that same boat where you just felt at the time, if you just exercised because you did, you knew you could get away with it and you weren't putting on the weight. Uh, and then eventually what happened? Well, I mean, I'm, I'm six, four and just genetically, I'm modestly broad shouldered, a little muscular. And so if I worked out for a couple hours a day, I could eat whatever I wanted to, J just like you're describing whole pizza, maybe two boxes of muffins or chocolate or bagels or anything that wasn't nailed down was really fair game. Um, <laughs> and that worked for me until I didn't really have the time to work out and I got a little older and my metabolism slowed down. So I was married and commuting two hours each way to go to graduate school and take classes and see patients. And then I'd get home at night and my wife wanted to talk to me or she wants to talk about the business. And I didn't have two minutes a day to work out most days is what it felt like. I now know you can make the time if you really want to, but at the time it felt like I didn't have the time. And I found that I couldn't adjust my food intake. 
it's like the previous intake had a hold on me and I'd be sitting and working with a suicidal client and thinking about when I could get the next pizza and yeah. working with a couple that just discovered a divorce and thinking about getting to the delicatessen and dislodging my jaw and just emptying the deli tray in there. That actually bothered me more than the weight because the weight didn't really come on that much at first. It was the obsession, the interference with my ability to be present and I come from a family of 17 psychologists and therapists, and what's always been most important to me is being a good doctor. That's always been the most important thing in the world, being a great psychologist. But I mean, I never lost anybody, and I saw 200 couples, and only two of them ever got divorced. So I must have been doing something right, but I wasn't 100% there. I couldn't lend people my soul, and it's not just an intellectual endeavor. People have to love and trust you enough to think new thoughts and leave their comfort zone and, and try new things. And I don't think I was giving them as much if I, as I could like that. And, and so I kind of went on a journey to figure out what was wrong. And from the family that I was in, it made the most sense to me. There must be a metaphorical hole in my heart, right? And if I could fill that hole in my heart, if I could love myself then, then I wouldn't have to keep trying to build that hole in my stomach. And so I tried and I went to the best therapists and I went to Overeaters Anonymous. I went on a spiritual journey. I saw the best psychiatrist that took medication. I went to nutritionists, dietitians, and I don't regret the journey. It was a very soulful journey. It's part of why I have the compassion that I have and feel like I'm the person that I am. But every time I would go see someone, I'd get a little thinner and a lot fatter a little thinner and a lot fatter, a little thinner and a lot fatter. And it took three major impacts to shift my paradigm. And I'll tell you that the paradigm that wound up working for me was more of a tough love paradigm. It's more of a be the alpha wolf of your own mind rather than a love yourself inner, nurture your inner wounded child paradigm. Um, and when an alpha wolf is challenged for leadership, it doesn't go, oh my goodness, someone needs a hug, right? It growls and it snarls and it says, get back in line or I'll kill you. And what changed my mind, what really brought me around after this, it was probably about 20 years that I was on this journey, I reached almost about 300 pounds. I don't know exactly because I stopped weighing myself. All kinds of medical problems, triglycerides and rosacea and eczema and Hashimoto's and all types of autoimmune issues. What turned me around were three factors in my life. I was consulting because I had, after graduate school, I had some time on my hand because my ex-wife was traveling a lot for business. And I started consulting for some of her clients, which were largely Fortune 100, Fortune 500 companies in big food and big pharma. And I did an awful lot of the food consulting. And what I saw was that they were spending tens of millions of dollars to engineer these hyper palatable concentrations of starch and sugar and fat and excitotoxins and salt. And it's all geared to hit the bliss point in the reptilian brain without giving you the nutrition to feel satisfied. And the result of that is you want more. You go looking for love in a bag, box, or container, and there's always some fat cat in a white suit and a mustache that's laughing all the way to the bank. Um, yeah. And so I said to myself, "What? This is not. This is not a psychological force. This is an external force that has nothing to do with what happened to me as a child, or that my marriage wasn't going really well. Yeah. Um, it's an external force." When you say that, when you talk about that, it reminds me of an old proverb. It says, the satisfied soul loathes the honeycomb, but to one who is starving, even that which seems bitter would be sweet. As as the big box nutrition companies, food companies, whatever they're selling us, we eat it, but it's not satisfying because it's mm. not meeting our nutrition needs. So it keeps us starving which we're willing to eat anything. Right. Yeah. And at the same time, your brain has been taught that the source of calories is in these bags and boxes and containers. So you go back for more because the, the brain is kind of like a calorie acquisition machine. A hundred thousand years ago, food was pretty scarce while we were evolving. 
And so when it learns that there's this concentrated source of calories available for not that much effort, and today you could buy 10,000 calories at a convenience store and walk right across the street and buy another 10,000 calories, probably less for, for the, less than $100. So your brain gravitates towards the easiest, most concentrated sources of calories and almost regardless of the nutrition, almost regardless. So that's part of how the addictive cycle starts. I don't like to think of it as a disease. I like to think of it as an automated habit loop. And that's why it, it feels so difficult to break because the brain really thinks it's a matter of survival. It's like your survival drives have been hijacked. I saw these really powerful external forces. I saw the advertising industry getting really good at convincing us that we needed these things. Like by taking vitamins out of this supposedly nutritional bar and putting money into vibrant, diversely colored packaging instead which in nature triggers a variety impulse because we're programmed, we've evolved to seek variety because there are a variety of micronutrients. If you look at a diverse multicolored patch of vegetables, you might see yellow carrots or red tomatoes or green lettuce or, or blueberries, which is not a vegetable. I can um, get that in a bag of Skittles, can I? <laughs> well, okay, I can get all the colors. They'd like you to think that. They'd like you to think that, <laughs> yeah. Yeah, I mean, I mean, so that's the kind of thing that goes on and so I said, this doesn't have anything to do with the fact that my mama dropped me in my head or I was in a bad marriage. Um, and then to top it all off, I actually had learned something in neurology class when I was in graduate school that I totally forgotten, which is that the reptilian brain doesn't really know love. The reptilian brain looks at something in the environment. Let's say this is the reptilian brain and it goes, do I eat it? Do I mate with it? Or do I kill it? Eat, mate, or kill like a bad college drinking game. On top of that is a mammalian brain that says, before you eat, mate, or kill that thing, what impact does that have on the people that you love or your tribe? And then the cortex on top of that says, before you eat, mate, or kill that thing, what impact does that have on your long-term goals, like weight loss and health and fitness and also music and spirituality and art and your work and your contribution to, to the so world? So the reptilian brain being the most simple survival without considering yeah, it's it's the seat of the survival's response. Fight or flight, flee or freeze, uh, feast or famine. If that, I that's don't the kill this, if I don't eat this, I'm going to die. Right. Yeah. Right. Yeah. And so, so that's the part of the brain that has the capacity in a perceived emergency, perceived emergency, to push your rational thinking aside. That's what's going on when you've read a diet book all weekend long and you're all psyched about it. But then at three o'clock on Monday afternoon, there's a chocolate bar at the coffee counter and it's got your name on it. And you're here, a little voice in your head that says, you worked out hard enough, even though it's not the weekend, you could have chocolate today. Just start your silly diet again tomorrow. That's why your rational thinking goes out the window. So here's what I did. Here's how I began to fix the problem personally. I'm Dr. Haley and oddly, the supplement that changed my health the most was not aloe vera. It was powdered fruits and vegetables but it did not come in capsules. I used to take a brand that came in capsules and I did not notice a difference. But when I tried a brand where the serving size was a scoop equal to more than 40 capsules, I could feel a difference. That's where Aya Green's powdered vegetables and fruits comes in. And to make it easier for you this month, April of 2024, you can use the coupon code IAGREE, one word, I-A-G-R-E-E, -E, without any spaces, to get 20% off a single can purchase. Normally you'd have to buy a bundle of three to save 20%, but I'm convinced you will notice the difference. You will notice the benefit and come back for more. There's a good chance you'll also find a free shipping option. So head to HaleyNutrition.com now and use the promo code IAGREE for 20% off IAGREEN's single can throughout April, 2024. Now back to the show. I set up a kind of a tripwire. I said, okay. I'm going to stop trying to love myself then. I went on this long journey. It's made me into a different person. I'm happy with who I am, but I'm still fat. <laughs> and I'm still eating a bunch of crap. I said, I'm going to set up a tripwire so that I know when this part of my brain is active. Because if I'm going to take control like the alpha wolf, I got to know when this thing is active. And by the way, I said to myself, this is just a biological urge like any other, right? The urge to eat 
consume mass quantities or eat as much chocolate as I could or eat a whole pizza. It's just a biological urge. It felt like a survival need, but it's no different than having to pee really badly or being really attracted to a woman on the street. It's something we're biologically programmed to really, really, really want to do. Yeah. And before, you, before you give it away, though, I have a question, because when you say alpha wolf, it almost sounds like like the alpha male, the willpower, the I can do this thing. The techniques we use actually reduce the need for willpower. Willpower is the ability to make good decisions. And it turns out that in many circumstances, not all, that willpower is depleted by the necessity of making decisions. So, for example, in our culture, we're told that we should eat well 90% of the time and eat healthy 10% of the time. But we're not really told how to discern what the difference is between those two different times. As a matter of fact, we're not always told exactly how to discern what's healthy and what's indulgent. We kind of sort of know, but we're not asked to make a really clear definition. So what happens then, if I say I'm just going to eat chocolate 10% of the time, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to avoid it 90% of the time, is every time I'm in front of a chocolate opportunity, I have to make another decision and exert my willpower. Mm -hmm. But if I say I'm only ever going to have chocolate on the last three days of the calendar month, then all of my chocolate decisions have been made for the entire of the month. Or I'm only going to have it on Saturdays, like we used in the example before. All of my chocolate decisions all week long are now gone. I don't have to use willpower. Those decisions have been made ahead of it. time. Um, and this is good for news for me who has little willpower. So I like what I'm hearing. <laughs> Well, yeah, and th there are other things you could do to increase your will, because there is there is some willpower you have to exert as you're extinguishing the craving, because the brain extinguishes cravings through discomfort. It's it's um. Let me jump over there for a second. See, a hundred thousand years ago, it was the people who had the strongest cravings that survived. Mm -hmm. If yeah. we didn't have strong cravings, we would not be motivated to do what was necessary to hunt and gather, right? To, to get food and procure it and eat it and bring it back to their family. And we wouldn't, we wouldn't be motivated. And so that's why we have such strong cravings. In the modern food environment, it's a liability, not an asset because food is so available. Right. But when food is really scarce, cravings really help us survive. Yeah. So the, the brain create, and you could probably take me to task on this. I'm sure you know or, more about or, it than I. Or slow metabolism. Mm-hmm. A slow metabolism is like an automobile that can go more miles on less fuel. It's an asset, not a liability, right? Right. Yeah. Yeah. So 100,000 years ago, the people with slower metabolisms would have lived longer because they could carry more fat to get through the famines. Right? Yeah. So you were talking about discomfort and we we're talking about willpower. And I want you to explain there is a need to use some willpower in order to extinguish your cravings. The brain forms a craving and extinguishes cravings in the same way by using dopamine for the most part. When you see a food cue, food cue could be the Dunkin' Donuts sign. It could be you know, a McDonald's sign. Sorry, it could be what? An aroma. It could be an aroma. Um, it could even be the feel of the sun in the air at the beach, which makes you want ice cream. Hmm. It's any stimulus that reminds you of the availability of calories and nutrition, mostly calories. Okay. So let's go back to 100,000 years ago and come up with an imaginary caveman named Thag, T-H-A-G. I just like the name. So Thag one day is out looking for fruit or something to eat. And he comes across a monkey and he happens to follow the monkey to a banana tree. And Thag is so happy, he gorges himself on bananas, takes them home for his family. They have a big old banana party. Thag's brain takes notice of that. And the next time Thag sees a monkey, a food cue, it revs up his dopamine levels to get him all motivated to go follow the monkey. If Thag doesn't follow the monkey, Thag's brain removes the dopamine and, and makes it less than what it was at resting state to make you uncomfortable. So a high amount of dopamine feels really good and motivating, pleasurable. A low amount of dopamine makes you mis miserable and cranky. So it's essentially, Thag's brain is saying, 
follow that monkey or I'm going to make you miserable, right? Okay. So what happens is that Fag gets motivated to follow monkeys and motivated to follow monkeys. And now he's got, sees the monkeys, Jones in for a banana, and he just goes to get the banana. And he's got this, this monkey banana habit loop. It's almost automatic. He doesn't even have to think about it. Then one day later in the season, the bananas start to run out. And Fag follows a monkey to a tree and there is no banana. That makes Thag's brain uncomfortable. And people would think maybe Thag would give up and look for some other animal or some other kind of fruit. But that's not really what happens. Because in nature, food would become intermittently available before it would become unavail unavailable. And in a scarce food environment, the existence of a food queue, like a monkey, which resulted in the acquisition of calories, sometimes, 80% of the time, 50% of the time, even 20% of the time, is better than having no food queue at all. So the brain is very reluctant to let go of cravings associated with the food queue, and it will put you through discomfort. As a result, when you first try to give up a craving, let's say I'm passing a donut store and having donuts every day on my way home from work, and I decide this has got to go. I make a rule that I'm just not going to stop at donut stores anymore. Well, there's a tiny bit of relief the first day or two. It's called the honeymoon period. And then all of a sudden, your brain has a little temper tantrum. I call it the where the F are my donuts or where the F are my bananas. It gives you worse cravings that you have, than you've ever had. You feel more uncomfortable than you've ever had. Most people at that point think, oh my God, this is torturous. It's going to be like this forever. I can't do it. And they do the exact wrong thing. At that point, they go back into the donut store and have the donut saying, I can't take this forever not knowing that it's going to start coming down if they go through that. But the brain is testing for the intermittent availability of donuts or the intermittent availability of bananas because it would have been better able to survive if it had these intermittent cues available. What you want to do is push through and then your brain starts to let go of the monkeys or the donut store sign as a cue. There are a couple of little, little bursts for a daily habit. Somewhere between the 21 and 30 day mark, you'll have a couple of little temper tantrums. And then your brain will label the craving as dormant. It won't erase it because the brain never forgets how it acquired calories because that's a survival advantage, but it will label it dormant because the brain doesn't want to waste energy either. And so it's entirely possible if you choose a particular food cue that's bothering you and you don't want to be bothered by it anymore, it's entirely possible to push through this extinction period, but you do need to have a little bit of willpower initially, just to get through that initial curve. Some things that help with that. So we know that decision-making interferes with willpower. Decision-making wears down your willpower. So if you can take several decision-free breaks over the course of the day. See, it's not just food decisions that wear down your willpower. It's math problems. It's who's taking Jenny to soccer practice. It's what suit do I wear to work today? Or should I wear a suit or not? Every decision you make wears down your willpower. So taking a few five or 10 minute decision-free breaks, put down your phone, walk away from the computer, walk away from anybody that can ask you any questions for a little bit, walk outside, take a few deep breaths, five minutes, a couple of times a day makes a big difference. It also turns out that the reptilian brain, the reptilian brain is not dominant over our neocortex in ordinary day-to-day -day life. But if it perceives there to be an emergency, it has the ability to push your higher brain out of the way. That's where you get the screw it, just do it response. Yes, I made these rules. I'm trying to follow this diet. I'm trying to do this plan, but oh, well, what the hell? Screw it, just do it. That's almost a universal response. And it occurs when you've introduced some level of organismic distress to your brain. Organismic distress could be a lack of appropriate nutrition. So if you skipped a meal or two, if you had a meal that was comprised largely of junk or processed food and you didn't get enough nutrition, if you're not eating regularly enough, your brain begins to perceive an emergency. Eventually it will adapt to that and get used to it. But in the beginning, it begins to perceive an emergency and it's much more likely to push your rational brain out of the way and say, screw it, we need calories, just do it. We're just kind of talking about ways to 
take the burden off of your willpower. So there's reduce your amount of decisions, there's adequate nutrition. Flood your body with nutrition on a regular basis at a slight caloric deficit if you want to lose weight. Then there's fatigue. When your body is overtired, when your brain is overtired, it's more prone to want more resources. There's also isolation. We're a pack animal. In primitive times, we were in danger if we were too far from the tribe. And so if you feel too much of a sense of isolation, your brain is more likely to perceive that there's an emergency. There's dehydration. Yeah. You don't have enough water. Right. You don't have enough sleep. All of these things. So what? So, it, what... so these are almost like you're you're supposed to have these things and your body knows it and something is missing and maybe you don't really know what it is, but the easiest, most consistent thing is I need food. Yep. I, the brain says I'm less likely to die of starvation. I'm less likely to die if I got more glucose in my system. Yeah. Interesting. Um, I got your one page and I thought this was really interesting and I should have read this at the beginning. It says, if you struggle with food in any way, from occasionally eating beyond your own best thinking to regularly consuming mass quantities, I'd like to make you an outrageous promise. Suspend judgment long enough to absorb a few unusual techniques and insights, and you can control your cravings forever. I'm not talking about white knuckle, hold on for your life control, but rather the kind you can maintain indefinitely without constant attention and thought. It goes mm -hmm. on and says, I know it's probably hard to believe where you stand right now, but you also won't need to rely on willpower because you'll learn to make these eating patterns a natural part of who you are. And provided you avoid extreme diets, which we've all tried different kinds of diets from eliminating carbohydrates or eliminating fats or one of the major food items, it, it goes on to say, providing you avoid extreme diets and reliably eating enough nutritious food, you can defeat your cravings on the food plan of your choice, low carb, high carb, plant-based carnivore, point counting, calorie counting, it's up to you. Lastly, defeat your cravings is a formula for taking control of your irresistible urges that derail you from goals and dreams in all life areas. You can use this same formula for a multitude of positive pursuits like exercise, parenting, finances, work, friendship, romance, productivity, and more. When I read that, I say, okay, wow. And in the book, it goes on a section similar to that has a bunch of promises after that. And it's kind of one of those things where, all right, it sounds too good to be true, but if it is, and I don't pay attention to this, I'm an absolute fool. Well, it's when you put it all together, it's kind of common sense. It's not commonly experienced because we live in a culture that tacitly agrees to support each other to kill themselves with food slowly while well, everybody laughs it off and jokes about it. And people are getting all the wrong advice about, they think that guidelines are better than rules. They think that rules are dangerous. They think that um, you should just eat when you're hungry and stop when you're full, even though the food industry has chemicals in a lot of these packaged goods that interfere with your ability to know when you're hungry and full. No. Or, or they think they can just eat mindfully. It, th there's a lot of mythology in the culture that prevents people from really understanding it. But it's not too good to be true because the brain does not want to waste energy. And pursuing a craving that you're never going to indulge, but even pursuing it conditional, even with contextual indulgences allowed, that's a waste of energy. And so the brain lets go eventually via that extinction curve that we talked about, an extinction burst and then coming all the way down. And so if I were to go for 60 days, pushing myself through that extinction curve and taking care of my willpower and fatigue and hydration and all the things we talked about, my brain is going to get used to it. And I'm going to start to become a person. It's going to become part of my identity that I'm just a person who doesn't eat donuts at the donut store. I'm, I'm just a person that drives past the donut store. And that becomes part of your character and character trumps willpower. So p people don't really understand the way that we're told that cravings are a disease, they're not a disease. There's no evidence of a disease process in place, at least none that I'm aware of. If there is some, please 
raise your hand and speak up. There's addictions um, and there's habits, but I don't know that those are disease processes. They're neurological pathways that have formed. They're things that our body got used to. Our body got used to feeling a different way and no one likes change, including our microbiome and everything about us. So it's not a disease process. There's physiological, neurological reasons for these things, but disease, no. Right. There's a difference between being powerless over something. In, in our culture, you're told that you're, if you have a serious problem with overeating, that you're powerless over food or that it's impossible. There's no really human defense. It's an irresistible urge. There's a difference between something that's impossible and something that's just hard. Like the way that I view it is there's a well-worn path up a mountain. It's a little bit steep. It requires a little bit of work and discomfort, but it's very well worn. There are thousands of people who've done it and you can take one step in front of the next and do it if you're willing to put in the work to do it. And a lot of people aren't. So that's why the disease concept yet has taken hold. Yeah. But you were getting to the tripwire and what was your tripwire and, and what'd you do about it when you, when you hit that? I, my first one was about the chocolate. What the tripwire does is it opens up a space between stimulus and response, right? Because we're talking about these automated habit loops where you see the banana and you're off to the races, or you see the donut sign and before you know it, you've already paid the lady and put it in your mouth. It opens up a space between stimulus and response. So you're not on the seafood diet anymore where you see food and then you eat it. You see food and then you can think for a moment. I wish I could tell you that immediately that that's a miracle. I was not immediately cured. What did happen was it became a lot less mysterious to me. I did something else, which is a little embarrassing as a sophisticated psychologist. I decided to call my reptilian brain my inner pig. You don't have to do that. It, this is not something I was going to teach, but I decided I was going to call it my inner pig. And so I had this rule that said, I'm not going to have chocolate during the week. If I was at a Starbucks and there was a chocolate bar on the counter and I heard that voice that says, just start your silly plan again tomorrow, I would say, wait a minute, that's not me. That's my inner pig. It's squealing for pig slop. Chocolate on a Wednesday is pig slop. I don't eat pig slop. I don't let farm animals tell me what to do. It was a crude way of opening up that space, but it worked for me because I'd say, well, I don't want this thing to be in charge. Who's in charge here? I don't want, I don't want that thing to be in charge. So what you do in that space, I'm sorry, do you want to say something? Well, I'm, I'm thinking for me, and I'm sure there's others that would hear that and say, okay, well, what if it's not something that's like chocolate where there's not so much a uh, nutrition benefit. There's some healthy aspects of chocolate and cocoa, but phytochemicals, antioxidants. But what if it's a healthy food and your problem is really just quantity? A couple of days ago, I bought 12 avocados. I think I have three of them left and I'm probably going to eat them today. And I can, I can have four or five avocados in a row or five or six bananas. Mm -hmm. Do I want to call them that? I wouldn't necessarily want to say that's pig slop because it's good for me too. And if I call everything pig slop, then what do I eat? Is there any well, what, negative what, programming you, that happens you, with that? You, you'd make a conditional rule. For example, I, I'm like this with nuts. Um, I did not take nuts and seeds out of my diet entirely, but when I had them in an unrestricted way, I really got out of control. So I eventually came to the conclusion that I should never eat nuts and seeds by themselves. And so eating nuts and seeds by themselves for me is pig slop. Anything that's off your plan is pig slop. So you draw the line any way you want to. It's just a way of aiming at a bullseye on an archery target and knowing exactly where the, the lines are so that if you miss by how much and in what direction to make the adjustment. So you could say, I'll never have more than one avocado per day. So that second avocado, that's pig slop, but that first avocado was good. Or, or whatever the line is that you want to draw, whatever you think is healthy. It, maybe, it's... maybe, maybe two. <laughs> okay, two. Okay, well, well sure. And, and would it instead of calling it pig slop, would it say any more than that is gluttony? If that works for you, yeah, yeah, that's that's fine. The point is to have something aversive that you don't want to associate yourself with, so that you wake up and you have the opportunity to remember why you made the rule in the first place. But then there's one more thing you can do in that space that was really helpful to me, and this is how I recovered. You can disempower, well, first of all, you can, you can disempower the reptilian brain and get back into your rational mind again by um, breathing out for longer than you breathe in. If you mm. 
breathe in for a count of seven and out for a count of 11, your reptilian brain will kind of come offline and your higher brain will come back online. Because when you, if, if you were running from a hungry bear, you wouldn't have time to breathe out for longer than you breathed in, right? You'd be going, <laughs> all your emergency systems would be activated. They call that the sympathetic nervous system. Um, but if you breathe out for longer than you breathe in, I'm not doing it now because it takes some time. But if you did that, you bring your parasympathetic nervous system back online, which is what slows you down and says it's okay to rest and digest and strategize and think and plan. And that's where you want to be to make the right decisions about food. As soon as the tripwire goes off, you bring your rational brain back online with your breath. That's often enough to stop you from doing what you were going to do. But after that, you can examine the logic, the voice of justification that was going to make it okay to have those extra avocados. Oh, they're healthy omega fats, and I got to get my calories from someplace. Um, and I have enough calories left for the day. I could have five of them today. It's no big deal. Then you want to ask yourself, what's wrong with that line of thinking? We call it a squeal, a pig squeal. And I'll be a little less good at disempowering this line of thinking, but I would say just because something is good for you in small amounts doesn't mean it's good for you in large amounts. I have plenty of omega-3. There are plenty of omega-3s in two avocados. I will feel less sluggish. My blood sugar system will function more optimally if I don't overload it with that today. And um, therefore, your line of thinking is wrong, Mr. Pig. So you can you can take away the pig's excuses. The example I usually use is when the pig says you can just start your silly rule again tomorrow. That's actually not true. It's not just as easy to start tomorrow because if you have the craving today and you have the thought just start tomorrow and then you reinforce both the craving and the thought by actually eating the chocolate or eating the avocado. <laughs> now you have two habits to break. Yeah, <laughs> right. Right. And, and, and then because you ha you'll have the habit of saying just start tomorrow again. So you'll be more likely to say just start tomorrow, tomorrow. And you'll be more likely to have a deeper craving tomorrow. <laughs> so if you're in a hole, stop digging. Use the present moment to be healthy. I like I, that. I call that a, a rational refutation. And it, it takes away your excuses. And it, it makes a previously greased shoot into more like something with sawdust and sandpaper and, and glass and broken glass on it. It makes it painful to go down. It doesn't make it impossible to go down, but it makes it painful to go down. And that's a lot of the battle for a lot of people. Yeah. 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 I'm getting a lot from this when you talked about the trip wire and creating space. And it's funny because I'm also thinking that that breath is also creating space and never really thought about switching it from a sympathetic to a parasympathetic uh, response and getting to a, a better place, a more less reptilian. I forget what the levels were in the brain. The reptilian being the uh, reptilian mammalian and neocortex. I'm, I'm, I'm an amateur neurology guy. I'm not a neurologist. So someone could take me to task with that, but that's how I understand it. No, well, it makes sense. It makes sense that in the most basic primitive level of thinking, it's survival. And then there's care for the family and the people around you and relationships and all those other things. And how does this, how am I going to feel tomorrow? How does this affect the people around me? So it, it makes a lot of sense. Yeah. When you were talking about the deceptions of the food industry, I actually thought of a study that I had done years ago, not a big scientific study because all it involved was watching TV. And I had watched enough TV to count the commercials and using more simple numbers, this is what I found. I found about every hour of TV, there would be about five breaks, commercial breaks, and each commercial break would have about five commercials in it. And most groups of commercials would have like at least, we'll say one drug commercial, one fast food commercial. There were... There, there was a pattern there. So we could watch TV for about an hour and see probably five fast food commercials and, and five drug commercials. They suggested that the average person was watching 20 hours of TV. This, this is going back. Now it's YouTube. And of course, there's advertisements on YouTube or there's social media and you get 
bombarded with advertisements. It's the same thing, just a different media now. But if we were watching 20 hours of TV per week, we would say, okay, and let's use simple numbers. I didn't watch 20 hours. I'm not, I'm not the average American. I watched only 10 hours. Okay, so 50 little brainwashings related to whatever that is times 50. Well, I took two weeks off here, so we'll keep the math easy and say, you know, 2,500 brainwashings per year. And if you've been watching TV for a decade or four decades, now we're up to 100,000 brainwashings in each of wow. those particular areas. Wow. Yeah. And it's no wonder why our brains will automatically finish the jingles like plop, plop, fizz, fizz. Oh, what a relief it is. <laughs> <laughs> How do you spell relief? R-O-L-A-I-D-S. And, and we haven't heard these things in years, but they're still imprinted on our brain or the nighttime sniffling, sneezing, coughing, achy, stuffy, head fever, so you can rest. Uh, NyQuil. And in the same thing with food, have it your way. At Burger King. I don't know if those jingles exist. Now we're getting, ba -da -ba -ba -ba, you know, other things where you hear that and you just think quick satisfaction. And we are being programmed mm -hmm. to take that in. Now, I'm in business and I've always thought if I want to be successful, what do I do? What kind of product do I have? Something that people have to keep coming back for more or want to keep coming back for more. Something that tastes good, that they enjoy consuming, something that is slightly addicting. I mean, if you can nail these aspects of a product down, you're going to keep people coming back forever. Drugs do that. Fast food does that. A lot of the things that we're being marketed to have those qualities, and we are getting hooked and programmed. So I like how you made mention of that and the why and bringing in the colors and the different things that make our brain say, I need that. I want that. It's fascinating. I, that, that's a fascinating study. And I applaud you for taking the time to do that. You've got, yeah. you've got a well, you're doing to... something similar too. And when I signed up for your e-list, there was a question, something about like, what do you struggle the most with, or what, what's your temptation? And I think it was related to food. I don't remember the exact question. Worst craving. Worst craving. Okay. And for me, it, unfortunately, it's not a particular food. It's dinner. My wife makes everything good. And it, it's super healthy, but it's just hard to stop eating because it's so amazing, delicious. But I'm wondering what you have learned from all of the answers that have been submitted to you. And I understand that years ago, you also did a similar study related to that same thing of collecting data. What have you learned from that? Um, well, what I learned from the answers to the opt-in question about people's worst cravings, we, we actually did a more rigorous national survey with 2,800 people to figure out what people's worst cravings were going to be. I thought it was going to be chocolate. I was wrong. <laughs> Chocolate's easy for me to say no to. I don't feel good when I eat it. And it's easy for me to think about when I, when I am putting that to my mouth, how am I going to feel in an hour or how is it going to affect my sleep tonight? And it's not good. That's an easy one for me to say no to. And yeah. I understand that you were programmed a little bit differently in that way on chocolate. I, I eventually had to give up chocolate entirely. I, I started just eating it on the weekends, but that I'm one of those people that actually just didn't work for. So what I learned was that only 11% of the people say they can't stop eating chocolate. 28% of the people say they can't stop eating pizza. So it's, it's like more than two and a half times as difficult to stop eating pizza as it is to, or more, more than two and a half times as common for people to be addicted to pizza than to the chocolate. So that, that kind of surprised me. The prevalence of salty chip addiction, um, salty chips and salty nuts was also higher than chocolate, which surprised me. I guess the, the substance that is your poison is your poison. So it seem, seems like the whole world revolved around chocolate for me. <laughs> right. That's not how the world actually is. So I learned that. The study I did way back when, it took me about five years when internet clicks were cheap in the 90s and early 2000s. Um, I intercepted people when they were searching for stress management solutions. I asked them what they're stressed about and what kind of food they had trouble controlling when they felt stressed. And I found three things, um, none of which led me to the solution I talked about today. They, they actually kind of 
led me to realize that I was going in the wrong direction. But there are three interesting things anyway. One of them was that people who struggled with chocolate, like me, tended to be lonely or brokenhearted or a little depressed. People who struggled with uh, salty, crunchy things, they tended to be stressed at work. So potato chip eaters and, and it, or nachos or um, salty, crunchy things. They tended to be stressed at work. And people who struggled with soft, chewy things like pasta and bread and bagels, they tended to be stressed at home. Mm. Um, so I thought that was really interesting. Mm -hmm. I actually had this whole conversation with my mom. And I said, well, look, mom, I... I really can't stop eating chocolate. I felt like I couldn't at that time. And I know I do it when I feel lonely or depressed and I'm not in the world's best marriage, but where did this come from? How did I develop this habit? And she had this whole story about how when I was one year old in 1965, that her husband was, her, my dad was in the army. He was a captain and they were talking about sending him to Vietnam and she was terrified. At the same time, her father had just gotten out of prison at my grandfather, she had no idea he was guilty and she had idolized him. So she was almost suicidally depressed and almost catatonic staring at the wall. And she didn't have the wherewithal to love me and feed me. This is how I discovered the little pig inside me. She didn't have the wherewithal to love me and feed me. So she kept a big bottle of Bosco chocolate syrup in a refrigerator on the floor. And she said, go get your Bosco. And I go running over and I'd open the, the bottle and I'd suck on it and go into a sugar, chocolate sugar coma and leave her alone and she could stare at the wall. And you'd think that if my personal psychology really had a lot to do with why I was addicted to chocolate, that at that point, we'd have a big cry and a big hug and a catharsis and we'd we just, I'd never have trouble with chocolate again. And it was a really good conversation. I did have a metaphorical hug with my mom over Skype. And um, I'm glad we had the conversation because I hated myself less after that. And I learned a lot about my mom after that also. But my chocolate eating got worse at that point because there was this stupid voice in my head that would say something like, you know what, Glenn, you're right. Our mama didn't love us enough and she left a great big chocolate-sized hole in your heart. And until you can fix the marriage or get out of the marriage and find the love of your life, you're going to have to go right on eating chocolate. Yippee, let's go get more. That voice of justification. And that's when I decided, well, that's my inner pig. That's the thing that I have to beat. Mm -hmm. um, and just like a fire in a well-contained fireplace, if there's something poking holes in the fireplace, that fire is going to get out and burn down the house. But if you can fix the fireplace, you don't have to fix the fire. You don't have to fix all those emotions. You just have to prevent them from burning down the house. So that's how I really switched my paradigm and started looking at opening up that space and disempowering the rationalizations and everything else that we've done all these years. Well, that's pretty neat. What's one of your favorite testimonials related to what you do? Oh God, we get them every day. Isn't that the best? I, it, it's really the best. My favorite testimonials are not the ones of, oh, I lost a hundred pounds and you saved my life or anything like that. Well, we, we get enough of those, but I really don't think this is about weight loss. I, I think it's about self-control and self-mastery and the elimination of food obsession. And so my favorite testimonials are people that say, I have the presence to be with my kids. I, ha I have the energy to work on those projects that I've been putting off. I'm doing better at work. I'm making more money. You know, I'm making love to my husband again. I'm just a lot more present. I haven't lost all the weight yet. I, my tagline is the back door to weight loss um, because it really emphasize getting control being able to follow, starting with one simple rule, flooding your body with nutrition at a slight caloric deficit, really living a much more balanced, even life with food so that you can let go of the existential angst that says, just hand over the chocolate bar, nobody gets hurt. It, it's, um, <laughs> you, can, you kind of, <laughs> I mean, anybody who's, who's lost, I lost a word with a chocolate bar in 1982 and I didn't come up for 30 years. So um, anybody who's been through that 20 years. Anybody who's been through that knows what I'm talking about. And those are my favorite testimonials. They're the one that are about, I gave them their mind back. And they can, they can yeah. think and breathe and be present for their loved ones. Wow, that's great. How many books have you written? I've written eight books. To feature your cravings is the one to read. You can read the other ones after that. But that's the most up-to-date, comprehensive rewrite of everything that we've done. 
the books kind of wrote themselves. Like after I'd seen about a thousand clients, I worked with 10 other coaches over the years and we have coaching groups and this is not all individual one-on-one -on -one by me. But after I'd been exposed to about a thousand clients, I realized there were all these specialty topics, like what are the binge triggers? And there are all these different things that trigger a binge. And what do you do about the specific triggers? And what about people who struggle with nighttime overeating? What about, um, you know, one of them was a workbook. The interesting tricks we found about nighttime overeating, I have not seen one case of nighttime overeating solved unless they're willing to eat breakfast. And most nighttime overeaters tell me that they don't want to have breakfast. They're usually intermittent fasters often, and they don't want to have breakfast. And I've not seen one case solved. No. Without well, that's interesting because coffee is probably not breakfast. So you probably nailed me on that one. I have one more kind of awkward question. And then there's, a, I know you needed 30 seconds. The awkward question, um, and I'll go first on answering this one, is what's in it for you? Now, mm -hmm. for me, the answer would be because I have a company, people buy things from me. I create content. I give a lot of information away. What's in it for me? The, the number one thing, the best pay that I receive, and you kind of alluded to this already, is the thank yous I get from my customers. Mm -hmm. Thank you for having for having these products available. There's nothing like this. Thank you so much for what you do. The pay that I get that helps me feed the family and stuff, that's important. It's beneficial. I love the fact that I'm doing something that I love to do and it's helping people. When you're writing books and, and people are signing up to your email lists and things like that, what's in it for you? Very similar to you. I, I get to make a difference while I make a living. I've had money. I've lost money. I always have the ability to make enough. I don't have kids. I have family, but I don't have kids. We don't have a lot of expenses. So I can live on not that much. This, this doesn't actually make a lot of money. People are going to say, well, you have a coaching program for $1,500. They have no idea how much it costs to advertise and put it all together. And there are months when I don't take a salary at all. I can make a lot more money if I went back into corporate consulting, but I feel like that's the wrong side of the war. Um, there have been times when it's a struggle to keep it afloat because I don't sell pills or potions or powders, which would be an easier way to make money here. We sell coaching, we sell books and tapes. That's basically what we do. Um, so what's in it for me is to make enough to make a living while I make a difference or make a difference yeah. while I make a living. What's in it for me are the testimonials I told you about. Right. I also get to work with this group of really amazing coaches. like, And they they teach me stuff all the time. Like it's not just me out in the front lines, figuring it out there. They're out in the front lines, figuring out and that also, and they're my captains, right? If I'm the general, they're, they're my captains and they, it's, it's just lovely to be able to work with them and I look forward to the meetings every week. So that that's what's in it for me. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. That's good. Anything else that you wish I asked? You mentioned that you needed 30 seconds at the end. Well, no, I just, you told them in the beginning, I've got three things for you at defeatyourcravings.com. Click the big blue button, sign up for the reader bonus list, get the lead magnet, which is a free copy of a book in Kindle Nook or PDF format. There is nothing held back in the book. You do have everything you need to implement this in the book. It's a very comprehensive book. Some people like coaching. Some people who go to look for the free Kindle Nook or PDF book decide, no, I'm going to buy the Audible version or I'm going to buy the paperback. Those aren't traditional charges. But anyway, the, the book is free in electronic format. If you um, also do that, you will get a set of food plan starter templates. So this is a diet agnostic program. I personally am a plant-based person, but I work with people on ketogenic and point counting, calorie counting, whatever your program happens to be. It doesn't matter as long as it's not too extreme. I can't help you if you want to be a breatharian. I can't help you if you want to have 500 calories of protein shakes per day because you're going to be starving and your brain is going to override your, your best judgment. Most any rational plan we can help you with. I wish people would stop arguing so much about plants versus animals and instead focus on getting the processed junk out of the system. Um, that's my background and what I know is doing most of the damage. You also get a set of recorded full-length coaching sessions. A lot of this sounds both harsh and a little overwhelming in the abstract, but when you hear it implemented with real people, this is all free, then you'll see how you can go from feeling uh, powerless and confused and overwhelmed 
and pessimistic to feeling optimistic and enthusiastic and confident about food in, in just one session, really. And it's all at the future cravings to come. There's a lot more there, but it would take me forever to explain the 20 bonuses. So click the big blue button, sign up for the reader bonuses. Uh, have a listen, see, see what you think. Awesome. For those listening, I will have links below the video, below the podcast, make them easy to click to get to Dr. Livingston's website and to download the, the freebies. Um, Dr. Livingston, thank you so much for joining me. I love and appreciate you. you. I can tell you're making a huge difference in the world. And I just thank you for what you do and for making this so available. Thank you for having me so much.